Uh, cold cash be a government. Only fools and on the frame Study self to know self. Uh, if you got a problem, that's not my problem. I don't got those real or better known as Mr. Solver. So specialist, especially on a night like Saturday. Ring around the roadies and Saturn at the same time. Pockets full of posies, pills, folks, and there's some dead guys. You could call me King James or Holy Franchise 7 Eleven. On the corner with Mark Dice, I be my brother's keeper. Only hit the ladies' demons. The Verify team is here to stop misinformation in its tracks and get you the vetted truth. On Twitter, you may have seen people sharing this article from January 2017. It quotes Dr. Anthony Fauci, saying that President Trump will, quote, no doubt, face a surprise infectious disease outbreak. And some people are using this article to fuel conspiracy theories. So we're verifying. Did Fauci really warn more than three years ago that Trump would face a surprise outbreak? Our researchers analyzed the article, which says that Dr. Fauci made these comments during a forum about pandemic preparedness at the Georgetown University. There will be a surprise outbreak. We then tracked down this recording of that event, where Fauci says that the Trump administration will likely face both ongoing diseases and new ones. There's no doubt in anyone's mind that they will be faced with the challenges that their predecessors we're faced with. So yes, Fauci did predict that there would be a surprise disease that the Trump administration would have to face. But that does not mean that Fauci predicted this coronavirus. What he was doing was generally describing what presidents face based on his experience advising five of them at the time. And if you listen to his entire 37 minute speech, Fauci talks about diseases that emerged or intensified during his tenure. For example, HIV AIDS, West Nile virus, SARS, H1N1, Zika, and Ebola. So there's no crystal ball here, just a senior health expert explaining how to plan for future pandemics by looking to the past. 60 Minutes Rewind. With SARS breaking out in China again, the Chinese have ordered the mass slaughter of animals known to carry the virus. But scientists admit they still don't know where the virus is coming from, what the original source of SARS may be. Every year or so, a new virus seems to spring out of nowhere. Along with SARS, there's been West Nile virus, monkeypox, HIV, and a virus you probably haven't heard of yet, a nasty killer called Nipah. Recently, we went to the Far East with a group of American scientists who were involved in a new kind of detective work. They're virus hunters looking for the next big killer. They're finding that new viruses are leaping from animals into man in surprising ways. And there's no better example of that than the search for the origin of Nipah, a bug so lethal they had to build a prison to hold it. That prison is a sophisticated biocontainment lab in northern Malaysia. The Malaysians never had one of these labs before, but they had to build this one to isolate some of the only live Nipah virus in captivity, collected during the only known outbreak. We went inside with government scientist, Dr. Abdul Aziz. The main feature of this uh, laboratory is the, is the safety, how, uh, what we call it, uh, complete containment, meaning anything that come in cannot go out. Complete containment. Complete containment, 100% containment. Why 100% containment for Nipah virus? Well, consider this. SARS kills about 9% of all those it infects. NEPA kills 40%. So this is live NEPA virus yes, yes, in yes, this yes, dish. Yes. They keep the virus-infected tissue to study NEPA, a virus that's probably been around for millions of years, but apparently never killed a man until recently. The lab is working on ways to identify any future outbreak quickly because now that they've got it bottled up, they don't ever want to see what they saw in 1997. 97 was the year that out of nowhere, people began to die. 265 people came down with terrible symptoms. Temperature, fever, headaches, but fairly quickly it went into uh, a coma and uh, unconsciousness and then people needing to be uh, on ventilators. Dr. Hume Field is an Australian virus expert who was alarmed by just how fast people were dying. Dr. Fauci, we don't know whether the pandemic started in a lab in Wuhan or evolved naturally, but we should want to know. 
Three million people have died from this pandemic, and that should cause us to explore all possibilities. Instead, government authorities, self-interested in continuing gain-of-function research, say there's nothing to see here. Gain-of-function research, as you know, is juicing up naturally occurring animal viruses to infect humans. To arrive at the truth, the U.S. government should admit that the Wuhan Virology Institute was experimenting to enhance the coronavirus's ability to infect humans. Juicing up super viruses is not new. Scientists in the U.S. have long known how to mutate animal viruses to infect humans. For years, Dr. Ralph Barrick, a virologist in the U.S., has been collaborating with Dr. Shi Zengli of the Wuhan Virology Institute, sharing his discoveries about how to create super viruses. This gain-of-function research has been funded by the NIH. The collaboration between the U.S. and the Wuhan Virology Institute continues. Doctors Barrick and Shi worked together to insert bat virus spike protein into the backbone of the deadly SARS virus and then used this man-made super virus to infect human airway cells. Think about that for a moment. The SARS virus had a 15% mortality. We're fighting a pandemic that has about a 1% mortality. Can you imagine if a SARS virus that's been juiced up and had viral proteins added to it, to the spike protein, if that were released accidentally? The hunt for the origin of Nipah virus carried us out onto the South China Sea off the coast of the Malay Peninsula. We're heading to a volcanic island called Palau Tiamen, west of Borneo. It's more than 150 miles from the outbreak on the mainland. Now, this island is not very developed, but there are a few small settlements along the coast. However, the interior of the island is just pure primary rainforest. Dr. John Epstein and Dr. Peter Daszak are virus hunters traveling the remote corners of the earth for the Consortium for Conservation Medicine. That's a partnership of schools, including Harvard, Tufts, and Johns Hopkins, along with the U.S. Wildlife Health Center and the Wildlife Trust. It's an American program looking for viruses on the far side of the planet. What do you say to somebody who's watching this interview and they're saying to themselves, look, I'm not a pig farmer in Malaysia. <laughs> you know, sure. I, why, why should I worry? We never had monkey pox in America. We don't even have monkeys in America. Okay, how do these diseases pass into a place that seems to be completely unrelated with the increase in global travel, with the increase in trade, with the increase in human activities all over the world, the world's becoming a very small place. So just because there may not be Nipah virus in America right now doesn't mean that a similar virus can't emerge there or that other unknown diseases can't pass from wildlife into people in America. We're back at the Nipah Virus International Conference in Singapore, recognizing discovery of this virus 20 years ago. And my guest is president of EcoHealth Alliance, Peter Dashak. Welcome to TWIV. Why is it to be here? Dashak, is that good? That's great, perfect. Where are you from? I'm from the UK, but the name's Ukrainian. Really? Yeah, yeah. So at some point your family moved my, from- My dad was Ukrainian. Ukraine. I want our listeners, and we have many, between 10 and 20,000, science aficionados, including scientists. I want to learn about the EcoHealth Alliance. What is it? Well, we're a, we're a non-profit, a typical charity. 501c3, yeah, right? Yeah, 501c3 <laughs> in the US. But we're very focused on research. So what we're trying to do really, I guess the difference that we're trying to do is do the science and publish in the best journals you can go for. Mm -hmm. um, a typical academic strategy um, funded by federal government and other sources, but then try and take the science and do something with it on the ground. So that's the charity side. That's the, that's the 501c3 side of it. Got it. So I, I like to try and mix mm. that together. I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Fauci, do you still support funding of the NIH funding of the lab in Wuhan? Senator Paul, with all due respect, you are entire, entirely and completely incorrect that the NIH has not ever and does not now fund gain-of-function research in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Do they fund Dr. Barrick? We do not fund Do you fund gain Dr. Barrick's gain-of-function research? D Dr. Barrett does not do gain-of-function research, and if it is, it's according to the guidelines, and it is being conducted in North Carolina. 
You don't think inserting a bat virus spike protein that he got from the Wuhan Institute into the SARS virus is gain of function? That is not. You would be in the minority because at least 200 scientists have signed a statement from the Cambridge Working Group saying that it is gain of function. Most new viruses infecting man are coming from the wild. In fact, almost um, 75% of the emerging diseases in humans actually come from animals, wildlife or domestic animals. So normally, you need to go to those wildlife species and look for the virus there. They've come to look at Tiamen Island because they suspect that they will find the animal that first carried Nipah, the original source of the virus. Dazak told us that if this kind of work was done decades ago, it might have changed the history of AIDS. With HIV, we're looking at a virus that emerged from chimpanzees in Africa sometime in the last century. That virus emerged into one single person hunting chimpanzees. It was a single person event. Wouldn't it be amazing to go back there in time and to see that virus actually emerge and say, hey, wait a minute, don't butcher that animal. You're going to have a virus that then goes on to kill 40 million people. And that's what you're hoping to prevent. Exactly that. We're looking for really the next HIV, the next SARS. What worries me the most is that we're going to miss the next emerging disease, that we're going to suddenly find a SARS virus that moves from one part of the planet to another, wiping out people as it moves along. And I think we need to get out there and look for these before they emerge. It's important to remember that we don't yet know the origin in the wild for the virus that's causing the pandemic, which is officially known as SARS-CoV-2. It's very close, about 96% the same as a particular virus in bats. How do you know which is the band that corresponds to SARS? So you really, we, we, we can look at that. Peter Daszak worked with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and they literally captured 10,000 bats. And they took blood samples from the 10,000 bats, and they found 50 coronaviruses that had been unknown. No one knew they were out there, and yet they had the capability of moving from the wild into human beings. So they created a catalog of the genomes of all of these viruses. Have there been any benefits from this work so far? Well, you know, the the breakthrough drug remdesivir that seems to have some impact on COVID-19 was actually tested against the viruses we've discovered under our NIH research funding. And so that testing would not have been possible if it it hadn't been for the work that you did with the NIH grant. Correct, it would not have been able to happen and we wouldn't have known how good this drug remdesivir is. That, so do you still support sending money to the Wuhan Virology Institute? We do not send money now to the the Wuhan uh, Virology Institute. We support sending money. We did, under your tutelage, we were sending it through EcoHealth. It was a sub-agency and a sub-grant. Do you support the money from NIH that was going to the Wuhan Institute? Let me explain to you why that was done. The SARS-CoV-1 originated in bats in China. It would have been irresponsible of us if we did not investigate the bat viruses and the serology to see who might have been or, infected in China. Or perhaps it would be irresponsible China. to send it to the Chinese government that we may not be able to trust with this uh, knowledge and with this uh, incredibly dangerous viruses. Government scientists like yourself who favor gain-of-function research... I don't favor gain-of-function research in China. You are saying things that are not correct. Government defenders of of gain-of-function, such as yourself, say that COVID-19 mutations were random and not designed by man. But interestingly, the technique that Dr. Barrick developed forces mutations by serial passage through cell culture that the mutations appear to be natural. In fact, Dr. Barrick named the technique the noceum technique because the mutations appear naturally. Nicholas Baker in the New York Magazine said, nobody would know if the virus had been la- fabricated in a laboratory or grown in nature. Government authorities in the U.S., including yourself, unequivocally deny that COVID-19 could have escaped a lab. But even Dr. Xi in Wuhan wasn't so sure. According to Nicholas Baker, Dr. Xi wondered, could this new virus have come from her own laboratory? She checked her records frantically and found no matches. That really took a load off my mind, she said. I had not slept for days. 
the director of the gain of function research in Wuhan, couldn't sleep because she was terrified that it might be in her lab. Dr. Barrick, an advocate of gain of function research, admits the main problem that the Institute of Virology has is the outbreak occurred in close proximity. What are the odds? Barrick responded, could you rule out a laboratory escape? The answer in this case is probably not. Will you in front of this group categorically say that the COVID-19 could not have occurred through serial passage in a laboratory? I do not have any accounting of what the Chinese may have done, and I'm fully in favor of any further investigation of what went on in China. However, I will repeat again, the NIH and NIAID categorically has not funded gain of function research to be conducted in the Wuhan Institute but of Virology. You do support it in the US. We have 11 labs doing it and you have allowed it here. We have a committee to do it, but the committee has granted every exemption. You're, you're fooling with mother nature here. You're allowing super viruses to be created with a 15% mortality. It's very dangerous. I think it was a huge mistake to share this with China. And it's a huge mistake to allow this to continue in the United States. And we should be very careful to investigate where this virus came from. Epstein planned to catch them by throwing up a detour on their commute. He raised an almost invisible black mesh, strung up like a too tall volleyball net. Here we go, ready? Here we go. Bring it down. Come on. Careful. Ready? Come on, go. Where is it? Yeah. Get the net up, please. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, where's the other one? Well, this one's pretty tangled. Bagging bats turned out to be the easy part. What do you have? So this is a young male island flying fox. He's probably about a year old. Um, he's in very good condition. And you can see, you know, they're called flying foxes because their heads really do look like a little fox with wings. Epstein anesthetizes the bat. He takes tiny pieces of the wing and some blood, and then he swabs around those needle-like teeth. And what does the swab in the mouth tell you? One of the places that we believe that we actually know Nipah virus um, is present is in the saliva. We found it on a piece of fruit that was being eaten by a bat. We actually found real virus. They so found real Nipah virus in a piece of fruit that had been chewed up by a flying fox. The bats don't seem to carry enough virus to infect people, but the pigs became virus incubators, amplifying the virus billions of times and then coughing and sneezing on the farmers. Nipah has probably been around for millions of years, so why didn't this happen before? Because the bats are on the move today, chased out of their natural habitat by man. Because of forest fires? Yeah, forest fires and deforestation, slash and burn agriculture. And uh, fruit bats were seen here for the first time in many years. And obviously, if you're a fruit bat, you, you see a very healthy mango tree, you'll just come down and start feeding. So uh, how do you pay for all this? You have people give money, right? Raise money, yeah. And uh, we, you know, another advantage of being a 501c3 is we have this history of being a charitable sort of conservation, saving wildlife organization. So we've got all the major donors that support that. We've got the public that donate. We have a charity uh, gala in New York every year. So we have all these sort of nonprofit things we do, but over 80% of our funds comes from federal support. So we, mm -hmm. like a u university department, we're going after federal money all oh, the time. Yeah. Okay. Is, is it difficult to raise enough money for your needs? Uh, well, it's great when you get it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, it's not easy, is it? I mean, it's pretty brutal, isn't it? I mean, if you look at your success rate on federal grants, I guess the average is, 10% or something. So we've probably hit an above average, mm. but it's just hard to spend so much time on a grant and sure. then it gets rejected. No, I, it's upsetting. I'm very aware of that because that's how we support our lab. It's getting harder yeah. because more and more people are coming in the field, which it feels is good, that way. but it's very competitive. And the money has not gone up sufficiently. The problem is when the money does go up, it doesn't matter because the universities grab it for, <laughs> for well, making we, buildings. We have an overhead, but of course, <laughs> That's the other thing, you're a small organization. Everyone knows where the overhead's going. We, yeah, you yeah. know, there's no, you, you see the benefits of that because it goes right back to you. So that's another slight advantage. Do you have support from say, Gates Foundation? No, we don't, we've never got Gates money. And I think that Gates, Gates had a strategy of 
specifically targeting things that they consider neglected, diseases that were neglected. We're working on what they consider not neglected diseases. Even NEPA, which isn't a big pandemic um, issue mm -hmm. every year, to, to Gates it's considered um, neglected, uh, not neglected. But they're, they're kind of moving into this space a little bit more, but we've never got funds from Gates. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I guess judging from this meeting, NEPA is not neglected. Right. No, not right now. No, right. there's a lot of people, which yeah. is good. But on the other hand, um, well, he he can decide where to put his money. But there That's are right. other, there are other I, charities I also. But you oh know. yeah, yeah. I mean, we get money from foundations. We get money from mm -hmm. private sector. So one of the things we've been trying to do is we work a lot on the underlying causes of pandemics: deforestation, climate change, wildlife hunting. That's our conservation side as well. Mm -hmm. So we go to foundations and say, look, you've been trying to stop the wildlife trade in China for 20 years. You've put all this money into it. If you have a health angle to that, it really does work. Yeah. The, the markets, the wildlife markets in China were never closed down because of, you know, ethical concerns or mm -hmm. conservation. But the minute SARS emerged, they closed them down. Right. So that's right. the argument we use. And we're trying to put the health in conservation. I see. Dr. Fauci, as you are aware, it is a crime to lie to Congress. Section 1001 of the U.S. Criminal Code creates a felony and a five-year penalty for lying to Congress. On your last trip to our committee on May 11th, you stated that the NIH has not ever and does not now fund gain-of-function research in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And yet, gain-of-function research was done entirely in the Wuhan Institute by Dr. Xi, and was funded by the NIH. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to insert into the record the Wuhan virology paper entitled Discovery of a Rich Gene Pool of Bat SARS-Related Coronaviruses. Please deliver a copy of the journal article to Dr. Fauci. In this paper, Dr. Xi credits the NIH and lists the actual number of the grant that she was given by the NIH. In this paper, she took two bat coronavirus genes, spike genes, and combine them with a SARS-related backbone to create new viruses that are not found in nature. These lab-created viruses were then to shown to replicate in humans. These experiments combine genetic information from different coronaviruses that infect animals but not humans to create novel artificial viruses able to infect human cells. Viruses that in nature only infect animals were manipulated in the Wuhan lab to gain the function of infecting humans. This research fits the definition of the research that the NIH said was subject to the pause in 2014 to 2017, a pause in funding on gain of function. We actually shot the story just in the last couple of weeks, and then after we shot the story, we discovered that the Trump administration had canceled all of his funding, $3.7 million to be spent over five years. When we started to dig into that, we discovered that it was all part of this conspiracy theory, the facts dead wrong, that the $3.7 million was being given to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, the Chinese Institute of Virology in Wuhan, China. Well, it was never that. That was based on a conspiracy theory. It was based on bad reporting. The $3.7 million was to Peter Daszak's US-based, New York City-based EcoHealth Alliance which does this virus investigation work all around the world. Well, we're trying to um, look at patterns of wildlife trade that, in, that include a risk of new diseases emerging. So we're doing a couple of things, really. So one is around SARS. We focused on SARS coronavirus emerged from a wildlife market mm -hmm. and was the first pandemic of this century. So it's a big event. Um, so we we started to trace back from the wildlife market which species carried the virus that came into those markets. We found that it was bats, not mm. civets was the original idea. Right, right. So then we started looking, where did they come from? And we went out to southern China and did surveillance of bats across southern China. And we've now found, after you know six or seven years of doing this, um, over 
a hundred mm. new SARS related coronaviruses, very close to SARS. Some of them get into human cells in the lab. Um, some of them right. can cause SARS disease in humanized mouse models and are untreatable uh, with uh, the therapeutic mm -hmm. monoclonals and you can't vaccinate against them with the vaccine. So these are a clear and present danger. Yeah. We've even found people with antibodies in Yunnan to SARS-related coronaviruses. So there's like human exposure. Right. Microphone. Your microphone. Senator Paul, I have never lied before the Congress, and I do not retract that statement. This paper that you are referring to was judged by qualified staff up and down the chain as not being gain of function. So what was, saying, let me take, finish. You take an animal virus and you increase its transmissibility to humans, right. you're saying that's not gain of function? Yeah, that is correct. And, and Senator Paul, you do not know what you are talking about, quite frankly. And I want to say that officially. You do not know what you are talking about. Let's okay, you get NIH. one person. Let's read from the NIH Madam Chair, definition can I answer of gain the of function. This is your definition that you guys wrote. It says that scientific research that increases the transmissibility among mammals is gain of function. They took animal viruses that only occur in animals and they increase their transmissibility to humans. How you can say that is not gain of function. It is not. It's a dance and you're dancing around this because you're trying to obscure responsibility for four million people dying around the okay. world from a pandemic. And let's let send Dr. Fauci. I have to, well, now you're getting into something. If the point that you are making is that the, the, the grant that was funded as a sub-award from EcoHealth to Wuhan created SARS-CoV-2. That's where you are getting. Let me finish. We don't know. Well, we don't wait know a minute. It did I come can, from the lab, but all you, the evidence is pointing that it came from the lab, you, and there will be responsibility for those who funded the right. lab, including yourself. I totally This committee resent, will allow the witness to respond. I totally resent the lie that you are now propagating. Now, you could say, so who cares? You know, and that's one argument. But our, our strategy is any one of those could become pandemic. There's a lot of stochasticity in what happens then. Yeah. So if we look yeah. at all of them, understand patterns, try and reduce the number of spillover events we've got, you know. But if you, you're saying these are diverse uh, coronaviruses and you can't vaccinate against them, there are no antivirals, what, what, do, we, what do we do? Well, so I, I think that coronaviruses are pretty good. I mean, you're a virologist, you know all this stuff, but they, you can um, manipulate them in the lab pretty easily. It's yeah. just spike protein drives a lot of what happens with the yeah. coronavirus, uh, zoonotic risk. So you can get the sequence, you can build the protein, and we work with Ralph Barrick at UNC mm -hmm. to do this. Um, insert it into the backbone of another virus right. and do, do some work in the lab. So you can get more predictive when you find a sequence. You've got this okay. diversity. Now, the, the logical progression for vaccines is if you're going to develop a vaccine for SARS, mm -hmm. people are going to use um, you know, pandemic SARS as yeah, sure, sure. But let's try and insert some of these other yeah, sure. related and, and get a better vaccine. And I guess also knowledge of what's there. If you see something emerging, it give it a head start on making yeah. a vaccine or a therapeutic. That's true. And, and you know, better knowledge of where they are as well. So that yeah. you, can, you can put your money into these clinics that matter. And that's one of the big things that we've been trying to push. There's a lot of... Um, the word predict or the word, you know, the um, anticipating, forecasting pandemics, it, it, it doesn't mean you can stop them. That's the problem. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so what we're trying to do is say, on a global scale, if we can show where they most likely to come from, the species they most likely to originate mm -hmm. in, the people most likely to get affected, a, a global actor like WHO or a national uh, government can better allocate resources to the highest risk. It's okay. pretty simple. What was, Wait, let me take, finish. You take an animal virus and you increase its transmissibility to humans, right. you're saying that's not gain of function? Yeah, that is correct. And, and Senator Paul, you do not know what you are talking about, quite frankly. And I want to say that officially. You do not know what you are talking about. Let's okay, you get NIH, one person. Let's read from the NIH Madam Chair, definition can I answer of gain of function. This is your definition that you guys wrote. It says that scientific research that increases the transmissibility among mammals is gain of function. They took animal viruses that only occur in animals and they increase their transmissibility to humans. 
How you can say that is not gain of function. It is not. It's a dance, and you're dancing around this because you're trying to obscure responsibility for 4 million people dying around the world okay. from a pandemic. 